have your Bibles, you can open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 9. I'll be there in a second. <clears throat> At the end of the last service that I taught on the fig tree, I left you with some obvious questions concerning the fig tree parable. And the question was, actually it was two questions, but probably going to be three if you break it up like this way. Who is the fig tree? Or what is the fig tree? And how long is a generation? Of course, we went back to Matthew 24. If you missed any of that teaching, I'm not going to repeat anything tonight. Listen to it. It was the first message. It was an introduction message to this topic in the last day series. <clears throat> These are the two obvious questions. And I said... It is obvious to me when I study the scriptures, I'm only going to give you a few scriptures, but there's many more, that makes Israel unmistakably the fig tree. God often compares Israel with a fig tree. Now there's other trees in the scriptures too. I might touch on some of that, but... <clears throat> Israel is compared with a fig tree. The reason I want, wanted you to start in Hosea, because even though Hosea <coughs> mostly ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel, remember Israel was the United Kingdom, and they broke up, and you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. You had the the house of Judah and the house of Israel, which consist of the house of Joseph and those other tribes, which were first taken into captivity and then dispersed throughout the world. And that gets into the lost tribes teaching, but that's not the subject. Here we read in verse 10, now God here in this chapter is keep is, is still punishing Israel. Now Israel here is directed toward the northern king as far as the punishment goes. Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. But he says in verse <clears throat> 10, let's just read it. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Circle the word wilderness there. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. There is that first connection of the fathers to the fig tree in Israel, not just the northern kingdom, but really, if you want to get down to the details, even the northern kingdom, but definitely also the house of Judah. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. Israel, the northern kingdom, were like grapes in the wilderness. There in the Hebrew, it's very clear what wilderness means. Something that's spread out in the open field. And that's what happened in the northern kingdom. It got dispersed about a hundred years after their captivity when they were taken by the Assyrian Empire. <clears throat> now Judah was taken later by the Babylonian Empire. But that's the first reference that I'm going to use tonight. And here God compares Israel to grapes in its totality and the followers to fruits of the fig tree. But then we go to another passage, and go with me quickly, to Joel. 
It's the next book over in the Old Testament. Try to make it easy on you tonight without hopping all over the place in the scriptures. The book of Joel. Here in the book of Joel, he speaks of my land as comparable to the fig tree. Again, showing that Israel, both ethnically and nationally and geographically, is symbolized by a fig tree. Let's just start with Joel chapter 1, verses, just start with verse 6. For a nation is come upon my land, strong and without number. Now, by the way, before I read the rest of this verse, Joel prophesied to the Sunder Kingdom, to the house of Judah mostly. He was a prophet that God committed to deal with the house of Joseph, Joseph, Judah. In verse 6 it reads, For a nation is <clears throat> come up on my land strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree, and barked my fish tree, or laid my fig tree for a barking. Stripped it. He hath made it clean bare, and cast away the branches thereof are made white. Once again, I repeat, Israel is being compared here and symbolized as a fig tree. Now, go to Jeremiah. Chapter 24. We're going to read, starting with verse 2, but here God shows Jeremiah a vision of baskets of good figs and bad figs. Both, by the way, the good and the bad are representations of Israel, mainly Judah here. The good are taken out of the land, that is, out of danger, and the bad are left to be judged. Now, I'm not going to get into it, because that goes again, once again, to Lost Tribes teaching. Jeremiah didn't go to Babylon. He took individuals with him, and he migrated west after the cap captivity by the Babylonian Empire of the house of Judah. And that's a whole other topic and for a different time. So some of the figs that were good were taken out of the land. And that's exactly what Jeremiah did. And they're out of danger. And the bad were left to be judged. Let's just read the verses. One basket had a very good figs, even like the figs that are the first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good, and the bad, evil, very evil. That cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Jump over to verse 5. Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, who I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Down at verse 8. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus said the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. 
Once again here, what is God doing? He showed Jeremiah a basket of good figs and bad figs, both representing Israel, both representing, in this case, the house of Judah. Now, <clears throat> as I said, and these scriptures don't necessarily cover it, but Jeremiah did go out with some good figs and migrated eventually west. But there's also good figs that were part of the captivity that landed also in the Chaldean lands. But there were plenty of bad figs. And no matter what figs you're talking about, they all represented Israel, like I said, in this case, the house of Judah. Now, go to the New Testament, chap Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> now, Jesus continues the comparison of Israel with the fig tree. And this happened during the final stages of his ministry. Now, Jesus has been ministering for three years. He's, making, he's made three different trips in three different years. And then he gives this parable as an illustration of God seeking good fruit from his vineyard, but finding none in Israel. Which is also mentioned in Isaiah chapter 5, but we're not going to go there. Jesus came expecting to find some good fruit and found none. So let's just read the verses in Luke chapter 13, starting with verse 6. He spake also to this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereupon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser, the vine dresser, of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and found, found none. Cut it down, why encumber it into the ground? And he, answering, and he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear, bear fruit, well, and if not, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shall cut it down. <clears throat> thou shalt cut it down. Here, Jesus had Israel in mind. And you can confirm that by reading further into the chapter. If you go down to chapter 13, verse 34, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, and as hen doeth gather her brew, under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus laments over Jerusalem here. Why? Because of their unwillingness to receive him. To receive him as the, as the Messiah. <clears throat> And he declares that their house is left desolate, my friends. And that's exactly what happens. The, the Jewish leaders of Jerusalem could no way say, by the time we get to verse 35, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, because they would not accept him as Messiah. So Jesus is dealing with this cursed fig tree. Now, as far as the scriptures go, I think I'm going to leave it there for now. But let me read you something else. 
me give you some little bit of history and further insight to this. Jewish men were to present themselves before the Lord three times a year. Jesus came up to Jerusalem via Jericho on a number of occasions during the three plus years of his ministry in order to celebrate the feasts. There was a fig tree by the road, Matthew 21, 19, that he invariably must have seen on a number of occasions as he went up to Jerusalem. The day of the triumphal entry, as he came up from Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus must have seen this tree and noted that there was, none, there was not any fruit on it, just as the landowner in the parable found none. Coming into the Jerusalem, he was hailed as the Messiah by the masses. He then drove out the money changers from the temple, foreshadowing his coming pronouncement that Israel, like the fig tree, was barren. In the evening, he set out for Bethany to spend the night with his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Bethany was on the same road which came up from Jericho. Returning to Jerusalem in the morning, Jesus passed by the fig tree, noted that there was no fruit on it when there should have been at least some early fruit. Seeing that, there, tree, seeing that the tree was unfruitful, he then cursed it. In Matthew 21, 19, I'll just read it to you. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Thus, remember that. Let me, write, let me say that again to you. Let no fruit grow on it again. Remember that. Immediately the fig tree withered away. Thus, just like his parable of the fig tree, he had come looking for fruit from the Jewish leadership for over three years and found none. They were like the barren fig tree with no fruit to be found. And so he then pronounced judgment on the worthless tree, causing it to die immediately, which symbolized the nation. With all of that as our backdrop, we then come to the time markers that he gave us during the Olivet Discourse. This time, reading Luke's account, Luke 21, verse 29 through 30. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. When Jesus commanded them to learn a parable from the fig tree, they must have had swirling in their minds the recent events of the parable and the cursed fig, for, cursed fig tree. The Hebrew Bible background makes it clear that Jesus is likening the Israel to the fig tree, and just as the fig tree withered, so too would Israel soon be destroyed by the Romans. I have to drink some water. Israel was destroyed by Romans in 70 AD, and then again in 135 AD. After the second Jewish revolt, they were warned not to return to Jerusalem upon pain of death. They were then dispersed to the four corners of the earth without a homeland for nearly 1900 years. Furthermore, the curse appears to apply to the land itself as well. Rabbi Cohen of Brooklyn discovered that the land of Israel, quote, suffered an unprecedented, severe, and inexplicable by anything other than supernatural explanations drought that lasted from the first century until the 20th, a period of 1800 years coinciding with the forced dispersion of the Jews. End of quote. Journalist Joseph Farah, prompted by the research of Rabbi Cohen, later discovered that only after the Jews returned did the rain begin to come. For 1800 years, it's, it hardly ever rained in Israel. This was the barren land discovered by Mark Twain. So-called Palestine was a wasteland. Nobody lived there. There was no Arab population to speak of. It only came after the Jews came back. Beginning in AD 70 
and lasting until the early 1900s, about 660,000 days of very little to no rain. I decided to check this out as best as I could examine the rainfall data for 150 years in Israel, beginning in the 1800s and leading up to the 1960s. What I found was astonishing, increasing rainfall almost every single year, with the heaviest rainfall coming in around 1948 to 1967. Let me read you another source of this drought. The Bible predicted drought after Roman dispersion. When scientists revealed in 2008 that an analysis of rings on stagmite, stagmites from a cave near Jerusalem showed the climate of the region got drier shortly after the Roman dispersion of the Jews in A.D. 70. It was no surprise to Rabbi Cohen of Brooklyn. In his book, he explained the dramatic climate change that took place when the Jews were forced from their homeland. Rabbi Cohen wrote that the land suffered an unprecedented, severe, and inexplicable by anything other than supernatural explanations drought that it lasted from the first century until the 20th a period of 1800 years coinciding with the forced dispersion of the Jews. Cohen saw the cataclysm as a miraculous fulfillment of prophecy found in the book of Deuteronomy, especially chapter 28, verses 23 through 24. Quote, And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under, thy, under thee shall be iron. Another scriptural quote, The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be <clears throat> destroyed. A year later, University of Wisconsin geologists did a comparison of, an, of the composition of individual rings that formed at the Sorek Cave. I'm going to paraphrase some of this now because of time in my voice. They concluded almost the same thing. That the rainfall was greatly diminished or non-existent. <clears throat> Before all this drying up process. The Jews, when they entered Canaan, after being in Egypt, not Jews, the house, the, the Israelites, the Hebrews, they weren't Jews, called Jews yet there. They were amazed at the land flowing with milk and honey. It was like a luscious, heavily forested area that could grow crops where people could be successful in raising their herds and so forth. And then, and that lasted all the way up to the period of around AD 70 and about another 1800 years where even Mark Twain said basically there was just a wasteland. And they did a survey of rainfall charts in Israel that confirms the severe droughts through that period. And they also confirmed, and you can seek this information out yourself and find it fairly easily if you know where to look, that the heaviest periods of rainfall was during the 150 year period when the Jews finally, or the Israel finally, were able to come back to their homeland with the heaviest rainfall amounts in 1948 and 1967. Of course, we all know what 1948 and 1967 means. 
in history. It's on our timeline. I thought you would find that fairly interesting. Then after those many years, as just as Isaiah had foretold, Israel was born in one day. In Isaiah 66, 8, it reads, Who had heard such a thing? Who had seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? Well, it was. For soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. On May 14, 1948, the fig tree declared independence and then was ratified as a nation by Edict of the United Nations and literally was born in one day. The year 1948 becomes the standard by which a generation can be measured against. <clears throat> Got a footnote here, which I also want to go to. <clears throat> and I'll conclude with this. An interesting circumstantial confirmation of the 1948 date is found concerning the birth of Abraham. According to biblical chronology, reading from the Masoretic text, he was born 1948 years after creation. Was that a coincidence? I don't think so. Well, that calculation is based on the year of creation and not the Gregorian calendar, the same number is striking. Furthermore, the date of Abraham receiving the covenant in Genesis 15 was given 2018 years. Given that birth of Abraham, the father of the nation, and the rebirth of the nation both occurred in the same year on their respective calendars, is it possible that A.D. 2018 on the Gregorian calendar will also be significant? Because this was written before that. So they're asking the question. What happened in 2018 that was significant? Do you remember? I talked about it. The United States Embassy opened in Jerusalem. Well, it really relocated from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem for the first time. And there's no nation without a capital. I've said that enough times. And they have a capital, even though they declared their independence in 1948. They didn't have a capital. And of course, 1967, we know they started to control all of Jerusalem. But there's, are there other dates? that we have to look for in a timeline besides those two dates? What happened in May 14, 2018? Which, by the way, was the 70th anniversary, according to the Gregorian calendar, of the creation of the modern state of Israel. You think that's a coincidence? Abraham was born 1948 years? Or the covenant, excuse me. <clears throat> I mean, the birth of Abraham was 1948 years after creation, and then receiving the covenant was 2018 years after the Abrahamic covenant. 2018 years, about ready to sneeze, and that's why I'm having problems here right now, after creation. I don't think it's ironic. Once again, the two sticks, the house of Joseph and the house of Judah, coming together once again on a very important date, May 14, 2018. And I've said it many times, 
in the past. If Trump was put in office for one thing and one thing only, it was for, the, for that accomplishment, which did happen. I don't think any, any other president would have done it. It's definitely not the one that's there now. The one that's there now is making deals with the devil. And you're going to see Iran probably, have, I mean, uh, Israel have to deal with that very shortly concerning Iran and its nuclear, nuclear capabilities. The 70th anniversary of the creation of the modern state of Israel, May 14, 2018. I don't think it's ironic. I think it's very interesting. But, are there other dates that we should be concerned with? Or not really necessarily the word concern should be used there, but we should be, definitely look into to try to really solidify this fig tree. Are you interested? If you are, let me know as I continue this next week, God willing. Play the song.